New glasses, new jumper, let's do it. This one's kind of a big deal. Kazuo Ishiguro is my favourite author ever, but I had never read one of his novels until now, and that novel is The Unconsoled. I had put this book off for a long time, mostly because of its length. It's over 500 pages, I struggle to read long books, I am a book critic, I have to do a lot of reading, and a 500 page book slows everything down. But it gets to a point where you realise that's ridiculous. You haven't read one of your favourite author's books and you need to get on with that. So what I'm gonna do is talk about The Unconsoled in two capacities. One. I'm going to talk about what the book is exactly. And did I say two first? No. I'm very tired, I might have done that. Two, I'm going to try my best to analyse the book. I'm going to talk about its themes and its point and also echo some of the things that I've read from smarter people, critics and Ishiguro himself in a few interviews that I read and watched. Let's go. The Unconsoled, as I said, is Kazuo Ishiguro's longest book. It was published in 1995 and it tells the story of a man named Ryder. Ryder is an Englishman. He's also a very celebrated and world-renowned concert pianist. And he has arrived in a random Central European city to do a concert. He travels constantly, putting on concerts, and while he's in a location he has to do interviews and meet people, and he has a schedule to keep. The book begins with him walking into this hotel lobby. This is the hotel he'll be staying in for about three or four nights leading up to the concert, which is the big crescendo of the whole novel. But as soon as he arrives there, things are a little bit weird. The hotel lobby is empty in the middle of the day to start with, and then he gets up to the desk and he's looking for someone, and the exact person he's looking for appears behind him as if from nowhere. And it's a little bit weird and a little bit scary in the kind of way that you giggle at nervously. Then the porter comes to take his bags and they get into the lift together and they have a conversation and the porter talks for an unbroken four or five page monologue about his job, his life, mostly the relationship between porters and the city itself, and how he believes that hotel porters are looked down on. This goes on for five pages. We haven't even reached page 10 of the book yet. It's a weird beginning. Now I know that The Unconsoled is very Kafka-esque in its form. I know that it is a very divisive book. This is a lot of people's favorite Ishiguro novel, and it's also a lot of people's least favorite Ishiguro novel, and that only made me want to read it more. And it begins with this monologue, so it's certainly off on a strange foot. From here, the novel is separated into four parts, roughly over three or four days. And in part one, Ryder spends the day jet-lagged and tired and constantly barraged with requests and things that he has to do and a schedule that he doesn't understand. He speaks to a woman who, again, appears from nowhere behind him and the porter in the lift, and she explains his schedule. And because of his awkwardness and his Britishness, Ryder doesn't correct her and say, I don't have my schedule, I don't know my schedule, no one gave me a schedule. He just bites his tongue, as British people often do, and just nods along and thinks, I'll deal with it later. And he never does. And so he's got this schedule that he doesn't understand, and he's constantly being given things. The book starts off strange, a little creepy, a little on edge. And from there, it becomes, to use Ishiguro's own words, an anxiety dream. I watched an interview with Charlie Rose from 1995 where Ishiguro talks about how this entire novel is an anxiety dream. How he's obsessed with the idea of life leading to something big. The idea of Judgment Day, of St. Peter at the pearly gates judging your life. The concept that our lives are building towards a thing, that we are all practicing and rehearsing and getting ourselves ready for something that life is a journey moving forward that has to reach something. Maybe it's your wedding day. Maybe it's a job interview. Maybe it's retirement. And this is kind of what Ishiguro in this interview was saying about this novel, that Ryder all the way through this book is building up to this performance that he's gonna put on and things keep getting in his way and there are challenges and hurdles and difficulties and most of all frustrations. And it very much is anxiety driven, and it very much is a dream. The entire novel operates on dream logic. For example, there is a scene where Ryder exits a building, gets into a car, 
and is driven pretty far away to the other side of the city. And he gets into another building, and he has a meeting, and he talks with some people, and then he realizes, oh, I'm in the same building that I left earlier. So he just goes through a door into the restaurant that he was previously in. This kind of thing happens in dreams all the time. We've all had dreams where a single location in a dream is a blending of two buildings or two places that we know in real life. Or a person that you know in one place is with you in another place out of nowhere, inexplicably. I've had hundreds of dreams like this, we all have. Ishiguro knows that. And there's a lot of dream logic in this. The best example happens very, very early on, which is when this porter that I mentioned turns out to be the father of Ryder's wife. He's talking to the porter, who is a man he's just met, and the porter says, look, I've got this daughter and she and I have a weird relationship and, and I think she's a bit depressed at the moment and she needs someone to talk to and it just can't be me. She's in a cafe down the road right now. Can you go and talk to her? And Ryder does, he goes and talks to her, he introduces himself to her. She has a kid. Ryder talks to the kid. And then as their conversation goes on, she reveals a familiarity to Ryder that wasn't there before. And Ryder goes along with it until suddenly their relationship morphs into that of husband and wife. And he comes to realize, oh, this is my wife. This is my son. This is my family. It makes no sense. It is a dream logic situation. And this happens constantly all the way through the book. Again, early on, there's a scene towards the end of part one where he wants to go to bed, but he's been told to go to the cinema down the road. So he goes to the cinema and 2001 A Space Odyssey is playing. And he says, oh, that's one of my favorite films, brilliant. He goes to the cinema and in the cinema are a bunch of people that he needs to know. People who are important in this town, people who are fans of his, and he starts talking to them. And they're all having full conversations with him while the film is playing. And occasionally throughout this scene, he's looking at the screen and watching what's going on. Oh, this is the bit where this happens. But these people are all talking to him. And then a group of them are playing a board game. They're playing chess or something, as far as I remember, or a card game, something. And this happens in dreams where two things are happening simultaneously that just don't happen normally or couldn't happen. The idea that these people are playing a card game in a cinema, having a conversation, and all these things are happening at once. And part one and part two are really where this happens the most. There is so much dream logic in this film where places overlap into each other, situations blend together that shouldn't blend, people talk and behave in strange ways. It's a difficult read in that way, and I can see why the comparisons to Franz Kafka are made so often. But this isn't really a Kafka-esque novel. I kept saying it was up until I actually read it because that's what I kept hearing. There's so much Kafka in it. And I understand, but it's not actually about the Kafka-esque. Snowy was stirred by the mentioning of Franz Kafka. She has very good taste. So I'm a huge Kafka fan and The Unconsoled does follow Kafka logic. It reminds me of the trial. The idea that this guy is expected to be somewhere and do something and he's done something wrong and he's being put on trial, but he doesn't know why and it's all circular. The Unconsoled is like that. It follows the physical structure of a story like The Trial, but it doesn't have the themes of Kafka, in my opinion. So it's Kafka-esque in its form and structure, not in its meaning and its themes and its ideas. So it's half Kafka-esque. All the way through this story, Ryder is expected to talk to people, or he's unable to say no to people, and he falls into situations all the time. He needs to help someone with something. He's been asked a favor. He has a meeting he didn't know about. And these things just keep on coming up. And he's getting more and more frustrated as he needs to practice his piano and get himself straight and just get some sleep at one point. He hasn't been allowed to sleep. And people are expecting so much of him. And there is a lot of Britishness in this book. I've read criticisms, I've read interviews, I've even read Ishiguro himself talk about this character, Ryder, as someone who is kind of wasting his life, who is unable to just be, <laughs> just be clear about what he wants and what he needs and what is important. And no one has mentioned the fact that he just feels very British to me. There's so much Britishness to him where he's more worried about offending people or he is just too awkward socially to do what needs to be done or prioritize the right things. There are so many moments in this book that just felt very British and I thought, I know someone who would have behaved that way or I would have behaved that way in that situation. Especially early on, the scheduling bit. I probably wouldn't have gone, actually, I don't have a schedule. I would have been like, hmm, schedule, I'll nod along. 
and I'll deal with this later. And it just feels very British. It felt very relatable to me and my personality to a point. But Ryder is also frustratingly socially awkward. To the point that you think, how did he become famous? How did he become so well regarded in the music industry as a public figure when he just can't pull his finger out and do anything? I've also seen that people have talked about how this book is very much another example of that one theme that Ishiguro repeatedly treads. Kazuo Ishiguro has repeatedly explored the notion of a wasted life in his novels. The best examples are An Artist of the Floating World and The Remains of the Day. In his own words, Ishiguro said that Remains of the Day is basically a remake of Artist of the Floating World. And I noticed that too once I'd read both novels. One is very much a retread of the other. They are both about old men who are stuck in their ways, who are living in the past, who are unable to see the world around them and be part of it. They have wasted their lives by being too conservative, too unmovable, too stubborn. And again, I do see that here in The Unconsoled. The argument that one critic made was that The Unconsoled is exactly like all those books. That Ryder is a man who does not know how to live his life constructively. He is wasting it. Despite being famous and successful and well-regarded, Ryder is still someone who just wastes time and energy and doesn't get things done. And it's frustrating. And yeah, I do see all of that. I can't disagree that this is once again a retread of that theme. And it makes me wonder about Ishiguro's own psyche. But I'm not the kind of person who obsesses over the artists who make the art. Even though Ishiguro is my favorite author, I don't actually know that much about him because I often don't care to. That's why I'm not an academic. But The Unconsoled, nonetheless, is a fantastic exploration of that kind of a person and that kind of a situation. The people who don't like The Unconsoled often say that it is too long, that it is too difficult, that it is like a puzzle or a labyrinth. I agree with some of that. I love the dream logic. I love the lack of clarity in this book. I love the way that it walks itself in circles and things don't make sense. And it feels like a fever dream. It feels like anxiety. It feels Kafka-esque. I love all of that. And I think that Ishiguro executes it perfectly, except it's too long. This book is set in four parts, pretty unevenly. And after part two, which is a little over halfway, I was probably two thirds of the way through the book and I thought, I feel like I'm done. I feel like I've got everything out of this that I can because it's treading water now. And the weird dreaminess of it actually eases off in the final third of the book. I was feeling like, well, what's left? All that's left is for him to do the concert. And I'm sure there's gonna be some twist about it. And I'm not gonna spoil the ending, but I was really looking forward to it wrapping up just because the book is too long. Again, in this Charlie Rose interview, Ishiguro talks about how long novels are a form in and of themselves, and I do agree. Short stories, novellas, novels, and long novels are all different art forms. They're all different disciplines that require different skills. And he wanted to see if he could write a long novel, and he did, and I like it. But it's still too long. It doesn't justify its length. I've read criticism that said that The Unconsoled was Kazuo Ishiguro poking fun at people, that it's all a prank. I don't agree with that, but I do feel like he unnecessarily set himself the challenge of writing a 500 plus page book when it didn't need to be that length. He could have made his point in three to 400 pages. If The Unconsoled was 400 pages, I'd say it's absolutely one of his best. Top two, top three. As it stands, I'm ranking it right in the middle because it's too long and frustrating. And I don't mean frustrating in the way that a lot of people have said. I don't think it's frustrating in its logic and its circularness, in its Kafka-esque themes. I don't think any of that is bad. I love how frustrating it is. And I actually don't think it is frustrating. At no point was I confused by what was going on. It all made sense in the logic of an anxiety dream. It all made perfect sense. There's nothing confusing about what happens in The Unconsoled. Not at all. Nothing is confusing. Nothing is taxing. It's not a difficult book. It's just too long. It doesn't need to be that length. It doesn't justify its length at all. So it's frustrating only because it's too long. And there are moments that feel like padding that could have been cut out that do not service the plot do not service the character, more importantly. They are treading old ground. Sometimes they're funny, and there is a lot of humor in this novel, and that kind of makes it worth it. But other than that, eh. 
doesn't justify its length. I think I could talk a lot longer about this book though. I think there are a lot of things that I've missed out, a lot of things that I wish I had done a better job of talking about. I can already sense it, but I'm very tired. I woke up at 6 a.m. today, which I haven't done in about four years. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. The Unconsoled is absolutely brilliant. I agree with all the positive praise it gets from other people. I disagree with a lot of the negatives, but my own big negative is that it's way too long. I'll leave it there. Subscribe for books.